Hi, and welcome to another chat. This one's going to be about how Ukraine is pushing the Russian Navy back in the Northern Black Sea. It's quite remarkable. I'm H.I. Sutton. I'm an independent defense analyst. Like my other talks, this is going to be unscripted. Also, my voice is a bit croaky, but uh, let's get on with it. The situation today is pretty much the same as the it was before the start of the war, and this is really remarkable. That is despite the fact that the Russian Navy is much more powerful than the Ukrainian Navy. Russia has a fleet that should have complete dominance of Northern Black Sea, but it's lost that dominance. So let's talk about how. Starting beginning February 23rd, 2022, so right before the, the invasion, the situation was this. Ukraine and the Ukrainian Navy control ports on Ukraine's coast so particularly odessa the blue circles also snake island which is strategically located off the coast and as close to romania as you can get in in ukraine Crimea is on the right and you've got the russian navy based primarily at sevastopol you've also got quite a few russian controlled gas platforms in the northern black sea these get overlooked a lot of the time but they provide surveillance situational awareness and so on for russia what russia did when it invaded on the 24th and 25th as well as obviously tanks and things coming north from uh from crimea they also took snake island almost immediately the cruiser moskova seen here in the sort of a blurred it's a screenshot of a video Forced the, the troops there to surrender, of course. And what this meant was that immediately Russia had complete dominance of the Northern Black Sea from the Ukrainian Navy. What did they do with this dominance? Well, they did five things. The first and probably the most impactful was they initiated a blockade. Several uh, third country merchant ships were attacked. They've, Russia has not admitted this, but I think, you know, it's not controversial to say this was Russia. And whether or not it was, Russia imposed a blockade and it was absolutely effective. A merchant ship stopped sailing to Odessa in particular, but to the coast of Ukraine to pick up grain and, uh, and gas and so on. They also acted as an intimidation force, sailing incredibly close to the Ukrainian coast, again, particularly around Odessa. This is a frigate seen off the coast, but several warships did this, and occasionally doing fire, uh, you know, artillery um, attacks on Ukraine. But more than anything, this is intimidation. This is complete dominance. They can sail within sight of the coast. They also threaten landings. These are called amphibious demonstrations. At this point in the war, a landing was a very real threat. And a lot of people will tell you that it was never going to be feasible. Maybe that's true, but it certainly was a, a, a serious threat and, and still is. Um, but what they would do is sail their ships incredibly close as if they were about to land and then turn around. And this is a normal tactic. It's called an amphibious demonstration. They also use the Navy to provide extended air defense further away from Crimea. In particular, the, the cruiser Moskova with its S-300 system was operating in the center of the Northern Black Sea and, at least on paper, was providing a, a massive air defense umbrella over most of the Northern Black Sea. The last thing they were doing was launching cruise missiles. Famously, the caliber cruise missiles, which are typically launched from ships or submarines. Also, the Onyx, which is launched in this case from uh, ground-based coastal defense batteries, but can, can also be launched from ships. So what was Ukraine's Navy doing? Well, as you probably know, a lot of it was captured or scuttled. It basically didn't put up a, a big fight. But some warships did survive and are still... So still operating actually um but the service navy just is no comparison to the russian navy and couldn't do much about it at all but ukraine or <laughs> sorry or someone has deployed anti-invasion mines mainly in these two areas that i've i've put a sort of red box around these very approximate areas 
Um, Russia's probably also deployed mines. There's a lot of, you know, who done it around the mines that occasionally break loose and float down, but this deters invasion and uh, was probably quite effective and still is quite effective. But things really changed in April. The warship, the, the flagship of the Russian fleet, Moscow, was sunk. There's loads of videos about this. I've done a video, but there's even better ones um, by other people since then analyzing why it was sunk. What's important here, though, is that it was sunk. This had a massive impact on the, the war. It's one of the biggest and most dramatic uh, naval engagements in history, probably. A lot, there's big, other big engagements, you know, Bismarck and so on. This is one to be in the case, uh, case studies for a long time. Interestingly enough, it wasn't done with service vessels. It was done with anti-ship missiles based on land. The... The Ukrainian Neptune missile system, ironically based on the Russian KH-35 switchblade missile. Switchblade, we think of a different missile altogether, a, a loitering munition, but uh, this is what NATO calls this weapon. The Ukrainian version Neptune is basically the same as a harpoon or an Exocet missile, effectively. That did away with Moscow, but Ukraine only had a handful of these. In fact, even before they were used, there were some questions whether Ukraine had any of these at all. Um, it seems they maybe had two or four and they've used up some. But fortunately for Ukraine, weapons started flowing in. Ah, uh, Not those weapons, these weapons. So weapons from NATO and uh, Western allies. First one to mention is Brimstone. It caused a buzz when it was first delivered, less so since, but it's a very effective missile for very short range engagements. It could be used against landing ships, for example. It's a very small warhead, so you're not expecting it to sink a ship, but it's definitely bad news for the invasion plans. Much more substantially, harpoons. These may be better or worse than the Neptune, but they're more plentiful. That's the key. And this really did change things. The harpoons were used firstly to sink a armed tug called um, the Vasily Beck. Interestingly, it's, a, it's described as a tugboat, but it's got a missile system on the back. Um, it was a really big deal. And you can actually see the second missile, that little white dot to the left of the explosion that's coming into double tap. They also possibly used these missiles to hit some of the oil, sorry, gas platforms in the Northern Black Sea. One of them caught fire and is still burning last time I looked a couple of days ago, months later. It's just been on fire since. And Russia actually started to withdraw from these platforms. As far as I can tell from open sources, they're no longer resupplying them like they were before. Ukraine has essentially nullified some of their um, situational awareness in the central Black Sea. I would caution not all of it, but, but some of it. What this meant together was that Ukraine increasingly could start to hammer Snake Island, which Russia had captured. And in particular, the TB2 drone of the Ukrainian Navy was able to start taking out small uh, assault boats and landing craft and air defense systems and helicopters on Snake Island. Other systems could also be deployed, obviously fighter jets, but crucially, the weapons supplied by NATO, the artillery pieces, could start to hit Snake Island from land. And this was the end for Snake Island, really. At the time, it was the Caesar system, which is 155 millimeter artillery piece supplied by France, but since then, Many other 155 millimeter artillery pieces that can reach the island have been supplied, and of course, the high mass um, multiple launch rocket system. Russia saw what was happening and actually withdrew from the island. This was the next big deal, and it is a massive deal. Um, these photos are from the Ukrainians that landed a few days later. But what this meant was that Russia essentially gave up its dominant position in the Northern Black Sea and started operating much closer to Sevastopol. They, because of the Harpoon missiles primarily, 
they were no longer willing to operate very close to uh, Ukraine at all. Not to say that they would that never, but the operations completely changed in character. But of course, caliber cruise missile strikes continue, particularly from submarines. Um, but these <laughs> these continued. Another thing that changed in July, and it's sort of out, out of scope of the talk, really, but worth mentioning for context, a grain corridor or agreement to allow grain ships to access Odessa was was made. And this is a screenshot from more recently from marine traffic, but you can just see, I've highlighted, put a box around it. You can see ships sailing to and from Odessa. That was not happening at all during the beginning of the war. Of course, flip side, they're also traveling to and from Russia. That's part of the deal. So taking the fight to Sevastopol. The first thing, and this is not so obvious from a naval perspective when this happened, I don't think most people were thinking of the naval implications, but there were a series of attacks on Crimea, in particular Saki Airfield. And that is where the Russian Navy has a lot of aircraft, including aircraft that are providing air cover to Russian Navy warships in the Black Sea. Now, these aircraft are still there, but these attacks really degrade the ability of the Russian Navy and Air Force to project air defense over the Northern Black Sea. They also started some drone attacks. There was a couple on Sevastopol targeting the headquarters of the Black Sea Fleet. That's the photographs from. And much more recently, an explosive boat, uh, an uncrewed service vessel, so a USV with explosives in it was found on a beach in Sevastopol. It seems the the object, the, the craft itself was unsuccessful, but it really brings home that um, Ukraine can reach warships in Sevastopol. It was blown up by the Russians. That's what the insert photo is. Really interesting vehicle. I've got some articles on that. Check them out. US Naval Institute News uh, most recently. And this led to some paranoia, really. The Russian Navy changed again. It became even more conservative. This is Sevastopol. The main naval um, berths are highlighted, those oblongs. Um, there are more, but they're the main ones. And all the ships going to and from them go through this narrow strait um, where the arrows are. And if we look at that straight, we find that Russia, after the USV turned up, started to deploy a boom across that opening at pretty much all times. Before The boom had been there before, but it had not been deployed. Um, there'd been a gap left. Um, so we see a change in status, and Russia decreased the number of ships sailing in and out of, of Sevastopol. Just for curiosity, that little blob at the northern end of that boom is where the dolphins are. These are Russian Navy dolphins tasked with deterring uh, sabotage, uh, combat divers from Ukraine. Russia started withdrawing its Navy, to, especially its submarines, from Sevastopol, and it had... It always had more than one naval base, but the the basically increasingly operating from further away from from Ukraine, and even the submarine support ship has moved. This is quite a big deal. It doesn't mean Sevastopol is closed. It doesn't mean that the submarines don't go there, but it does show how much of a threat it's seen in the Northern Black Sea. Things stayed like that until a few days ago. There's there has been a slight increase in activity after the Kerch Bridge attack, obviously around Kerch Bridge, but also around Sebastopol. It's too soon to see, you know, whether this is a new phase of the war in terms of the way that Russia's deploying its navy, but it might be. Russia really is in a bad state. Its, it's navy. Um, has been showing real problems for months now. And it's partly it's fatigue. It's had its forces in the Black Sea and also in other places such as Mediterranean 
essentially in fighting order for over six months now coming on to eight nine months and it's not it's not able to to maintain the same levels of activity that it was earlier in the war so fatigue it's also possibly running short on ammunition in particularly caliber cruise missiles and and key systems it's fuel supplies we don't know the exact level um i wouldn't suggest that it's out of fuel but it seems to be conserving fuel some of its sailors are fighting on land particularly the naval infantry but even sailors from ships and maybe from submarines are actually fighting on land and that is uh, going to be a serious weakening of the the navy the sailors some of them are conscripts they're going to be stuck there there's a lot of issues around crewing but the biggest deal i think is that russia's the navy in the black sea is losing any relevance and and the clarity around its role the war is now very much land war it always was the navy played an important role but it's getting less and less important of course that could change tomorrow but this video is today if you liked it please like and subscribe thank you very much should add if i didn't at the beginning um these are my own views but i'm aware that some academics and and defense analysts feel very similar i should just um give some credit i listened to a chat from a dr deborah sanders from king's college london just uh yesterday and i'd already been working on this video but she was making very similar points um let's say this is my take not hers but um but some credit there she definitely influenced me in a good way so thank you very much and uh yeah please share